Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to virtual seminars for Freaking Green Geology. Um, Ross, you can go ahead and uh, share your screen. Sure. Yeah. Um, my, I'm sorry, my cat, I don't know if you can hear it, but my cat's screaming at birds this morning. Um, hopefully it's not too loud. Um, but uh, today we're, we're excited to have uh, Dr. Ross Anderson presenting on Darwin's Dilemma, the importance of fossilization to our re reading of animal antiquity. Next week on the schedule, we have Dr. Lizzie Trower from University of Colorado Boulder, and who will be talking about their um, ongoing work on uh, giant neo neoproterozoic giant ooids. Um, so that's, that's what you have look, to look forward to next week. And I'll announce that as soon as I can. Uh, I sent out a message to everybody with a link to the code of conduct and a couple things to keep in mind. Uh, but without any more, I'm gonna go ahead now and we'll, well, Ross will speak for 45 minutes and then we'll have our, our discussion session. And I'm gonna go ahead and, and introduce him. So Dr. Ross Anderson is a geobiologist, paleontologist, and sedimentologist, particularly interested in the evolutionary history of eukaryotes and how the nature of the fossil record shapes our view of evolution. He received his bachelor's degree from the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department at Harvard in 2012, where he started his research with, uh, with Dr. Andy Knoll. He went on to Yale for his master's and his PhD working with Dr. Derek Briggs investigating the late Proterozoic fossil record and graduated from there in 2017. After his PhD, Ross had his postdoctoral post fellowship at All Souls College with the University of Oxford in, in the UK, where he's continuing his, best, his investigations of the eukaryotic fossil record. And as I was building his introduction, I couldn't help but notice uh, these sorts of phrases like, Microconcretions micro impact cereals or microfossils question mark and concretions or microfossils question mark. So I, I like to, I'm excited to hear some of his ideas on geobiology and taphonomy today. So please take it away, Ross. Well, thanks, Alex. And thanks to you and Andre for putting this series together. I think it's been uh, really great over the last year or so to bring our community together, together in this way. I found it very valuable, at least. So today, um, I know I know many of you on this call, but some of you I don't. So I thought I'd begin by introducing my own research in Oxford and uh, what I'm interested in. So I'm, a, as Alex said, I'm a Precambrian paleontologist, and I'm really motivated by how, when, and why eukaryotes initially evolved and diversified on our planet. If you look outside today, eukaryotes make up the bulk of documented biodiversity, and they play a key role in modulating the Earth system. But it hasn't always been this way. Um, for most of Earth's history, eukaryotes were either entirely absent or minor players in Earth's ecosystems. This is a, a molecular clock here, a recent molecular clock uh, built from the genetic data encoded in modern organisms for the whole tree of life by Holly Betts and colleagues at the University of Bristol. And you can see the three main domains of life here, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryote set against the geological timescale on the left. And what you'll notice is that the eukaryotes in gray have a relatively recent evolutionary history, perhaps as far back as one and a half or two billion years ago. And the other thing that you notice is that they seem to really diversify in the kind of later Proterozoic and into the Paleozoic. And it's this rise of eukaryotes between about a billion and 500 million years ago that I'm really interested in. And despite the fundamental importance of this uh, geobiological revolution, for the foundation of our modern eukaryote rich biosphere, we still don't know really much of this revolution. When did things happen? What, what were the underlying mechanics of this revolution? So my own research, research to understand this revolution uses the fossil record. Um, and fossils are key for three reasons. One is they can directly date evolutionary milestones. So for example, the first eukaryotes, cellular differentiation, the evolution of macroscopic size, but also they can calibrate and improve those molecular clock phylogenies that I showed before, which provide wider constraints on early evolutionary history. And the third aspect is that when they're combined with geochemical indicators for environmental change, these fossils can also be used to test correlations to possible 
environmental evolutionary drivers. So fossils of these early eukaryotes are really key, but there's a big stumbling block to their use. And historically, we've had a challenge in using them. While fossils have been used extensively to chart the history of life from the Cambrian explosion to the present, Precambrian fossils tend to be rare. Uh, and the reason is they evolved before the advent of biomineralization. So while Phanerozoic organisms like the T. rex or the ammonite or the trilobite that you see here had relatively well preserved shells and skeletons, those in the Precambrian, which tend to be microscopic and entirely soft, you'll recognize some of these from Nick Butterfield's talk a couple of weeks ago, these unusually you know, these entirely soft organisms required unusual and actually poorly understood conditions for their preservation. We don't really know the conditions under which these preserved. So, you know, simply put, we don't know where or how these precious early eukaryotic fossils get preserved. We don't know which precise lithologies to go look to find them. And we don't know how that early record is biased. Is it biased to particular times or particular environments? So my own research seeks to overcome this challenge through a, a dual approach. So on the one hand, I go out and I find new key phylogenetically informative microfossils, but that search is critically informed and systematized by research in the lab that I undertake to understand the conditions under which these things fossilized. So if we have a better understanding of the conditions under which these things fossilize, We've got a better chance of finding them. And also we know the extent to which the early fossil record might be telling us about evolutionary history, you know, providing a faithful record of evolutionary history. So today I'm, I'm not gonna talk a huge amount about my work on finding new fossils, but I just wanted to highlight some of the ongoing work that I'm doing at the moment. So we've got two big projects uh, ongoing. One is a field program in the Tonian of Svalbard, where we've been looking at when and how the evolution of major eukaryotic clades like the green algae first emerged. So some recent work we've been doing up there has uncovered this really beautiful population of this possible early chlorophyte alga paleastrum. And we've been doing some new, applying some new analytical techniques, for example, FTIR to look at the uh, organic composition to try and figure out what this actually is. We've also got a big project in Mongolia on the Ediacaran. And here we have a, a deposit which is quite similar to the Doshanto uh, formation. So we've got these beautiful phosphatized uh, Ediacaran, you know, possible embryo-like organisms. So we've been working there as well. The cool thing about these is they actually post-date the Shram excursion, whereas in China, most of these things actually predate the Shram. So this is quite an interesting discovery in Mongolia. But today, I don't want to focus on these new fossils. Instead, what I want to talk about is my work on fossilization processes and how this work is not only helping inform us on where to go look for these key fossils, but is actually providing key evolutionary insights in its own right, particularly about the bias of the early fossil record. To what extent can we trust this early record as a marker for evolutionary history? And the question I want to grapple with in today's talk, the key question I want to grapple with is how old are animals? And this is a, one of the most fundamental questions uh, in the rise of eukaryotes and in, and in paleontology in general. And it remains unanswered. We heard a few weeks ago from Nick Butterfield a little about animal origins. And I think he highlighted in particular the importance of knowing when this happened. Because if we know when it happened, we can test these ideas, some of the ideas that Nick was putting out there about whether animals actually played a role in transforming the Earth system or not, or you know, when this might have happened. And this is a question that's actually been around, you know, unsurprisingly for a very long time. Um, Charles Darwin famously lamented the lack of fossil evidence which he could use to constrain the timing of animal evolution uh, when he wrote in The Origin of Species. He wrote, it's indisputable that before the lowest Cambrian stratum was deposited, the world swarmed with living creatures. But to the question why we do not find rich fossiliferous deposits belonging to these assumed earliest periods, I can give no satisfactory answer. Basically, Darwin was stumped. When he went to Cambrian rocks, this is what those rocks look like. This is a, this is a artist reconstruction that was made for the recent first animals exhibition that we held at the Oxford 
uh, University Natural History Museum last year. Um, and you can see that this Cambrian world is already very diverse, right? We've got macroscopic organisms, we've got organisms with different tissue types, things burrowing, things moving around, predating on other organisms. You know, this, this isn't the first animals, right? This is a world that's quite advanced. So where are those first animal fossils? And, and this was a problem that, that Darwin grappled with. It was his dilemma in a sense. And today, a version of Darwin's dilemma persists. So if we are thinking about how to constrain the origin of animals, one line of evidence that we can use comes from molecular clocks. So this was that molecular clock I showed earlier by Holly Betts and colleagues. And what we can do is we can zoom in on the eukaryote portion of the tree on this clock. So we've just taken that kind of gray area here where the eukaryotes are zoomed in. And I've highlighted the animals in purple on this clock. Humans are the, the yellow star. And what you see is the last common ancestor of uh, extant animals inhabited the world around 800 million years ago, according to this molecular clock. Um, other molecular clocks, this is uh, another recent clock from 2015 by Maris Dos, Dos Reese, also from the Bristol group. Again, this one focused just on animals, so you can see the different animal groups here, and we're going back in time this way. Again, puts the date of animals around 800 million years ago. If we go to the fossil record, we see quite a different picture. So this is again, one of those artist reconstructions from our recent exhibit at First Animals, and it shows the iconic Ediacara biota. Um, and I think we're gonna have some talks about this in the coming weeks. I saw Lydia Tarhan was on the, on the schedule. And I know Alex Liu spoke in, in a previous talk. Um, but recently there's been quite a bit of progress made on what these strange Ediacaran organisms might actually be. So there's been recent advances in doing organic geochemistry from Joachim Brock's group and Ilya Bobrovsky, and then also work on their ecology and in particular development biology. And my own colleague at Oxford, Frankie Dunn, has been involved in, in some of this work. Um, and what's interesting is that it, this, these combined new data sets suggest that at least some of these organisms are actually animals. So what that means is we have unambiguous animal fossils dating back to around 575, 574 million years ago. So the first thing you notice about these two lines of evidence is that there's a 200 million year discrepancy. On the one hand, molecular clocks are telling us that animals are 800 million years old. And on the other hand, our fossil record maximally is extending 574 million years. So this is kind of the same problem that Darwin was coming across, right? He had this idea that animals must be older than the Cambrian because he predicted this very slow acquisition of morphological characters. But that the first animal fossils that he could find in the Cambrian were already microscopic and complex. So where was that missing fossil record? We really need a scientific explanation to explain this discrepancy. What is the truth behind the timing of animal origins? Well, there are really two options to bridge this gap. Okay, so on the one hand, molecular clocks might simply be inaccurate. Perhaps we're not very good at estimating the rate of evolution. Uh, and perhaps these are just giving us enormously old ages. Another option is that the pre ediacaran animals simply aren't preserved as fossils. Perhaps neoproterozoic rocks older than the Ediacaran didn't have the capability to preserve these organisms. And what I wanna to do today is really combine the results of several studies I've worked on over the last five years or so to, track, to try and track fossilization processes over this critical interval from about a billion years to 500 million years ago, in order to see if we can understand the extent to which the early fossil record might faithfully be able to document the origin of animals. And I should say from the outset that a lot of this work has been done together with my long-term collaborator and colleague, Nick Tosker at Cambridge. Um, we've combined our expertise, his in mineralogy and, and mine in paleontology to, to take on this project. So I'm immensely grateful for Nick in that regard. So to begin with, when we consider uh, the first animals, we need to think about what they were likely to have been like. 
How were they constructed? What features did they have or not, which made them more or less likely to fossilize? Because that's important, because then we get a sense of perhaps what threshold of preservational conditions we need to actually preserve these organisms. So we have some help in this regard, and that comes from a recent study uh, by Duncan Murdoch uh, in 2020 in Biological Reviews. And here we have a, a phylogeny, a tree of life for animals. We've got all different types of animals over here that live today. And we're going back in time. So it's again a kind of molecular clock. And on here, what we've got is basically the types of construction that these organisms had. What types of skeleton did they have? Did they have a calcareous skeleton or a phosphatic skeleton or perhaps not even a skeleton, you know, an organic skeleton, not even a mineralized skeleton at all? And the little pie charts at the end of each node tell you the likelihood based on the abundance of modern organisms of what, what each node is likely to be like. So as you go back in time, what you'll see is that all these pie charts basically go totally white. And what that means is that these organisms were most likely to be unmineralized. So that's the first thing we need to consider. We need to go, we need rocks that are able to preserve unmineralized organisms, organisms that have wholly organic soft tissues. So where do we go to find such fossils? Where's the best place to go look for such fossils? Well, the obvious answer comes from the Burgess Shale, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This is this amazing deposit, and there are many others like it uh, across the Cambrian world, uh, where we have the exceptional organic preservation of non-mineralizing organisms in fully marine siliciclastic sediments, in mudstones, essentially. And you'll see these iconic fossils that you've probably seen before. Uh, this banana-shaped atoya here, this kind of worm. We've got uh, the arthropod morella, the waxia here. And what's great about the Burgess Shale is it does preserve these soft organisms. I love these cartoons that were made in the 90s for a scientific American. On the left, you've got the Cambrian world as it would be known only from hard tissues. So we've got a trilobite, some brachiopods, a pretty depauperate world. Whereas on the right, we have the Cambrian world as we know it from the Burgess Shale. So suddenly we've got all these soft tissue animals. We see that there are animals that burrow. There are animals that are predating on things. There are animals that are moving along the sediment as well as anchored to it. And in fact, without the Burgess Shale, 89% of the genera would not be preserved. So it's really important. And the Burgess Shale is, is really good at capturing a wide variety of groups too. Among the modern animal phyla, there are only really five absentees from these famous deposits. And not only that, the Burgess shell is also really good at preserving microscopic animals too. So this is some work by Tom Harvey and, and Nick Butterfield. And over here, you've got this entirely microscopic animal, a lorisifrin, preserved in deposits like the Burgess shale. So here's the thing. If the first animals were small and soft, Burgess shell deposits would be the place to find them. So then we, may, we might then ask two key questions. One is, given that this is such a great repository, what are the conditions necessary for Burgess shell type fossilization? And then the second one is, do near, near Proterozoic fossiliferous deposits share these conditions? Can we find these conditions in the Precambrian? So we might have a chance of preserving these early animals in these older rocks. So I'm going to, today, in today's talk, I'm going to take each of these questions in turn, beginning with the first one. And we're going to look at what are the conditions for Burgess shell type fossilization. So given the importance of the Burgess shell to work on Cambrian life, there's been a huge amount of effort uh, and a plethora of studies on Burgess shell type fossilization, the conditions that lead to it. So there's been various factors proposed from limited oxidant supply, where that's oxygen itself or limited sulfate in these sediments. Um, the actual sediment composition, whether the, the minerals that are in the sediment can actually be toxic to certain types of bacteria or perhaps bind to enzymes and, and switch off decay. There's also the idea that maybe some of these fossils are actually mineralized, either in phosphate or perhaps pyrite or even clay minerals. And then there's also more recently from Bob Gaines, the idea that in the layers, you've got your layer with your fossil in the layers directly above, 
we've actually sealed those layers with early carbonate cement so that oxidants can't diffuse into the phosphoriferous layers. Now, I became quite interested in the role that clay minerals play because they've actually been implicated multiple times in these scenarios, either as a role in the host sediment, the idea being that some clays might be toxic to certain types of bacteria or might preferentially bind to enzymes that are important to decay. And they've been implicated by direct associations with the fossils, whether they actually bind to the, where they actually bind to the carcass and polymerize that organic matter, making the organic matter more resistant to decay, providing some kind of protective layer. So I became interested in this, and my interest was really piqued by the first taphonomic study I want to highlight today. And that was a study in 2016, led by uh, Sean McMahon, who was a postdoc in the lab where I was a graduate student. And Sean and I uh, worked on this project where we, we were interested in, is there a mechanistic link between clays and suppression of decay? Could clays really be important? So what we did was we grew a type of bacterium uh, called Pseudoralteromonas, which is uh, known to, is a marine heterotroph, and it's known to be involved in the decay of marine animals today. And we grew it in different media. So you can see, the way to read this chart is basically low growth is at the bottom, high growth at the top. We've got a bacterial, you know, a general bacterial control growth medium here. And then we've got media with different minerals. So we've got calcite and then a bunch of clay minerals, berthrine, glauconite, illite, kaolinite. And what was really interesting from this study was that there are two clays which really suppress decay. That this was the aluminium rich kaolinite and then the iron rich berthrine. And these had pronounced effects on, on the growth of this bacteria. So this provided a hint that there might be a mechanistic link between the type of clay that you have in your rock, suppression of decay, and perhaps promotion of fossilization. So spurred by this study, my next question was, well, is there any geological evidence that these minerals are actually in rocks that have birdish shell type fossils? Um, and it turns out there was very little evidence out there. There was, some work which had done some macrostratigraphic studies looking at the abundance of this iron-rich clay glauconite through time, so using the macrostrat database, and they showed this Cambrian peak in, in rocks with glauconite, but there was also a Cretaceous peak in rocks with glauconite, and there aren't any Cretaceous Burgess shales, so this wasn't particularly compelling. It also didn't, you know, we, who knows where these rocks came from, they, you know, it's almost certainly they didn't come from rocks that have Burgess shale fossils. So we, in 2018, I set out to try and find some geological evidence of what was going on. So I compiled a suite of Cambrian shale samples, uh, 213 Cambrian shales from 19 different sedimentary successions on four continents. And 131 of these shales contained Burgess shale type fossils. Those are the dots in, in red. And 82 contained only fossils with mineralized skeletons. So what we really wanted to highlight here was not whether the clays were controlling the presence absence of fossils, but where they were controlling soft tissue preservation. And so we looked at rocks that had soft tissues, Burgess shell type fossils, and rocks that had fossils which lived in a similar environment to those that lived in Burgess shell type deposits, but that only had hard tissues preserved, for example, trilobites or, or brachiopods. So we were really not looking at any ecological differences, we were looking at whether clays control preservation alone. And what we did with those rocks is we ground them up and we did powder X-ray diffraction. So this is what the results look like. And I'm gonna show actually quite a few uh, charts like this today. So I'm gonna introduce how these work. These are logistic regressions. And on the X-axis, you basically have the percentage of the rock, which is composed of your different mineral. And on the y-axis, we've got the probability that that rock has Burgess shell type fossils within it. Okay, so basically as you move along this compositional percentage, you, you change that probability. And when we did this work, it turned out there were four minerals which had statistically significant effects. Uh, berthrine, which we've already seen before, saladonite, and then two different types of elite. These basically just have, Elite one just has slightly more iron than Elite two. 
Now, what was interesting was there was only one of these minerals that actually had a positive effect. So the more of that mineral you had, the more chance you had of having Bode-Shell type fossilization. And that mineral was berthyrene. Um, in fact, if you have more than 20% of your rock composed of berthyrene, you basically guarantee that the rock has Bode-Shell type fossils, which was really cool. Um, Saladonite and the two illites actually had a negative effect. Now, what was interesting was the positive effect on berthyrene that actually showed up before, right? When we did our microbial experiments as being something that really suppressed decay. So now we've got a mineral which is suppressing decay of, by, by being toxic to uh, marine microbes that undertake the decay. And we found that in our Burgess shell type fossils. What's even more interesting is that we can do a um, kind of a classification tree where you, you basically start off here and you ask the question, how much elite one do I have in my rock? Do I have none or some? And you follow this down. And then you get to elite two, you ask the same, the same question. Um, if you follow the red bar here, you basically have a range of conditions under which Burgess shell type preservation is essentially guaranteed. These bar charts at the below, red is the proportion of your samples that have Burgess shell fossils, and the blue is the proportion that have just uh, mineralized skeletons. So if you follow this red pathway, you basically guarantee bird shell type preservation. And actually, both the multiple logistic regression and this classification tree can predict whether your rock uh, preserves bird shell type fossils with about 80% accuracy. So it gets it right 80% of the time. So that's really exciting because it provides, for the first time, a lithological search image, potentially, for the first animal rocks that might host the first animal fossils. So we've shown a significant relationship there between clay mineralogy and British shell type fossilization. But what does this actually mean in practice? What, how do these minerals form? And does this indicate any kind of environmental bias or temporal bias to British shell type fossilization? Well, it turns out berthyrene jet can form from the addition of iron two into kaolinite. So berthyrene and kaolinite are actually closely related minerals and basically you have some kaolinite and you dump in iron two into that structure and you, you have berthyrene. In contrast, our illite was probably originally some kind of smec type before burial diagenesis. So what are, what are these two key things tell us? Well, it, it suggests that we probably had a detrital input uh, to our sediment with a high kaolinite smec type ratio. And we also had a source of iron two plus in early diagenesis to convert our kaolinite to berthyrene. So where might these two factors be uh, achieved? Well, sediments with high kaolinite smectite ratios today commonly form in tropical weathering environments. Um, so places like the Amazon. And what's really cool is if you plot up the paleogeographic position in the Cambrian of Burgess shell type localities, they tend to be in tropical regions, consistent with a potential paleogeographic bias to the early fossil record. Um, if we look at uh, iron 2 plus, where we might find that, there are various different ways. Er Eric Sperling's iron speciation database suggests that the Cambrian uh, still has a high proportion of samples with ferruginous uh, conditions. Um, so we might have ferruginous water masses around. The other option is that with our early carbonate cements, which have been documented in some Burgess shell type localities, you might actually have closed system conditions generated where you could have repartitioning of iron from particulate oxides to silicates. So we might have some different sources of iron too. So this, the work I've talked about so far is really basically looking at associations between Burgess shell type fossils and their sedimentary matrix. What is going on in the sedimentary matrix that makes those rocks more or less likely to preserve these fossils. But clays have also been implicated in another way in Burgess shell type taphonomic studies. Um, in 1998, Paddy Orr and colleagues suggested that clays might actually bind directly to uh, the decaying carcass. And in this way, they might provide some kind of protective layer. So there might actually be a kind of direct association between the clays and the fossils, not just in the sedimentary matrix, but actually on the fossils themselves. And the evidence that, that Paddy and colleagues uh, presented in their science paper for this was 
some EDS data of different bird shell fossils showing that certain tissues, for example, the gut in Morella here, was enriched in uh, aluminium or other elements indicative of certain clays. So their idea was this, we've got our uh, fossil carcass here on the seafloor. So the dark brown is the fossil carcass, the seafloor is the kind of browny gray, and then our ocean water is here in the turquoise. And either detrital clays stick to the carcass, bind to the carcass, or clays get precipitated de novo on the carcass as it decays. And eventually you end up with a fossil with some kind of protective clay layer. Now, it wasn't long before this idea became quite controversial. And uh, Nick Butterfield and colleagues and some folks at Leicester um, suggested that there may be another way that these clays could have formed. Notably, the Burgess Shale, where the original data was collected, has been subjected to green schist metamorphism. And Nick and colleagues argued that maybe these clays didn't form early in diagenesis during decay, but actually formed millions of years later during the metamorphism, and as such played little or no part in the initial conservation of the soft tissues. So in their scenario, you've basically got a, uh, the fossil is already fossilized by other means, and during the metamorphic process, those organic tissues get volatilized, leaving a physical space, and depending on the composition of the evolving metamorphic fluid, certain minerals will precipitate into that cavity. And so you end up with uh, a fossil composed of those minerals. Now, the chemistry of that evolving metamorphic fluid would dictate the mineral formed, and it's likely to be some kind of elide or muscovite. So how do we differentiate between these two hypotheses? Did clays really play a role in the early, you know, did direct clay associations really play a role in the early conservation of the soft tissues? Well, the main problem with these studies was that the data they relied on was elemental compositions alone. And elemental compositions, while good, don't offer a pre precise um, account of how those minerals actually formed. Only if you know the actual mineral can you really get at that, that data. So what we've been doing in Oxford, and we published this last year in, in geology, was to, we've developed a method to analyze in situ and non-destructively using X-ray diffraction small areas of our fossils to actually target and, and find out exactly what minerals are on those fossils. So here's, a, here's an example, here's a fossil Morella, and we're able to target these small areas and you get diffraction patterns from them, which can tell us what minerals are there. We've combined that with EDS, like the original studies, so we've got a kind of combined data set. So here's what the data look like. This is quite a complex diagram, so I'll walk you through it. Along the top, we've got different taxa. So we've got five different taxa from the Burgess Shale. And then we've got different minerals along the left-hand side. And then we've got two uh, kind of box plots. One that the reds or the pinks are the fossil analyses actually on the fossils. And then the turquoise are ones on the matrix. And there's a few things to note. The first thing is that both fossils and matrices are dominated by chlorite, muscovite, quartz, and quartz with some minor calcite, dolomite, kaolinite, and pyrite. And the second thing is that we ran some partially Bayesian mixed effects models on this data. And what was interesting about that was we found that the presence of dolomite, kaolinite, and pyrite are all significant predictors of whether you've got, whether your analysis was taken on the fossil versus the matrix. So if you've got any of these three minerals, you're much more likely to be on the fossil versus the matrix. So this suggests that there are mineralogical differences between the fossils and the surrounding matrices. And excitingly, one of these minerals was a clay mineral, kaolinite. And this was actually really puzzling to us because if you think about the metamorphic history of the Burgess Shale, kaolinite simply shouldn't be in the Burgess Shale it should have disappeared during, uh, during the burial diagenesis in the metamorphism, you know, converted to elite or muscovite. So how come it's still there? Um, so one way it could still be there is through the idea of Nick Butterfield and colleagues and, and Alex Page and colleagues. So you could have your fossil fossilized, you could have 
The organics volatize, as they suggested, leaving a physical space. Into that space, you could have the precipitation of a metamorphic mineral, elite or muscovite, something of that nature. And then on the retrograde phase of the metamorphism, that metamorphic mineral could convert back into kaolinite. Now, if that was the case, there's something a bit odd going on because our spatial relationship suggests that kaolinite is only ever on the fossil. It's never, it's never found in the matrix. And elite and muscovite, which presumably a retrograde kaolinite would have formed from, are everywhere. They're on the fossil, they're in the matrix. And so if we expect kaolinite to form as a retrograde phase, surely it should form in the matrix too. So this, 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 this idea doesn't really check out, it doesn't work. So an alternative might be to go down the original hypothesis. This might provide a plausible mechanism for how kaolinite could survive through the metamorphism. So in this scenario, we've got early bonding of the kaolinite to the fossil, whether that's detrital kaolinite or it's um, uh, kaolinite forming de novo on, on, the, on the fossil. Um, and kaolinite is actually really well suited to bonding to organic materials based on its vast surface area of its edge sites. Um, and so once you've got that kaolinite in place, you've then got a very strong bond between the kaolinite and the organic matter. And that actually closes off the edge sites of the, of the kaolinite to subsequent uh, metamorphic uh, reactions. So what's cool is you might be having this mutually beneficial relationship whereby the organic matter is protected by the kaolinite bond and the kaolinite is protected by the bond to the organic matter. So I think what we've demonstrated here is that the kaolinite is playing a role when directly associated with the fossils. So we've resolved this kind of controversy for the first time with this new mineralogical data. So what have we learned from these first three studies about clays and, and Burgess shell type fossilization? Well, the first thing is, is that kaolinite and berthrine have intrinsic antibacterial properties. We showed that with the microbiological study um, that, I, that, that we worked on. The second one, the second point is that sedimentary rocks that host Burgess shell type fossils are enriched in berthrine, suggesting that clays suppress decay in the general environs of the fossilization uh, process. And this might have consequent paleogeographic, climatic, and or geochemical fossil record biases. And then the third thing from that very last study is that Burgess shell type fossils are directly enriched in kaolinite compared to the matrix. And this indicates that early direct clay organic interactions also played a role in fossilization. So what I wanna do now is return to our two questions that I set out at the beginning of this talk. So we've now uncovered something about the conditions necessary for Burgess shell type fossilization and the role of clay minerals. I now want to go to the Neoproterozoic and look at fossiliferous deposits there and see if they share these conditions. Is Neoproterozoic soft tissue fossilization the same as Burgess shell type fossilization? And what implications does the answer to this question have for how the early fossil record can faithfully chart the origin of animals? So we'll move on to this, this part of the talk now. So if we look at the Proterozoic fossil record of early eukaryotes, um, we find that it's dominated by microfossils hosted in mudstones. This is a recent compilation by Phoebe Cohen and, and Francis McDonald from 2015. We've got the geological time scale here on the left, and each one of these bars is an individual geological formation with fossil eukaryotes. And there are 59 of them. And the ones I've highlighted in blue, 47 of the 59, uh, are ones where we're hosted in mudstones. So mudstone hosted early eukaryotes make up the majority of the record. And we saw from a few weeks ago from Nick Butterfield's talk, a number of these fossils, right? You've seen them before here, isolated from the rock matrix. So the question is, this style of fossilization is actually quite similar, super, you know, superficially at least, to Burgess shell type fossilization. It involves organic remains preserved in mudstones, preserved in shales, and compressed along bedding planes. It's basically Burgess shell type fossilization, right? 
Well, the question is, is it? So to get at this question, I've been working with Tina Waltz and Susanna Porter, and Tina gave a talk last year in this seminar series and presented some of this data already, so you might have seen some of these graphs before. But basically, what we wanted to do together is to see, we wanted to try and replicate my 2018 study on the sedimentary composition of rocks hosting these fossils. Are the sediments again enriched in berthrine, like the sediments for the Burgess Shale was? Now, it turns out to be quite tricky to replicate this study, because if you remember in the Cambrian study, what we did was we compared rocks that had Burgess shell type fossils, so fossils with soft tissues, to those that had fossils again, but only fossils with mineralized tissues, so trilobites or brachiopods. So we were basically just testing preservation. If you go back into the Precambrian, where there are no fossils with mineralized skeletons, then we've only got really presence or absence. And that conflates two parameters. It conflates preservation, but also potentially ecological factors, where the organisms were actually present in the rock or not. So the cool thing of, that Tina has done is she circumnavigated this problem by building a data set of fossil preservation. So she's gone to these different places around the world where we have these early eukaryote fossils and actually characterize the preservation on a scale from a sc one being four, poor to three being good. And there's various parameters like pitting or the quality of the cell margin that we've looked at. And we've done this on a bunch of different places, 78 shales from 19 successions on three continents. And again, powder up the sample and do powder X-ray diffraction. So here are charts like you've seen before, logistic regressions. We've got the percentage of the clail on the bottom. And then this is the probability of you having really good preservation. So it's the probability of having a rank three, your fossils being rank three in that sample. And we've got pitting and the quality of the cell margin here. So two different parameters. Now, the first thing you notice is that the trends are quite weak. And this is a, a big contrast to the Burgess shell type data. We don't see these big shifts in probability with the percentage of the clays. If anything, we see a, a marginal shift in most cases. And the second thing which is really interesting is if you focus on the middle two panels here, the berthrine, remember for the Burgess shale, as we increase berthrine, we increase the chances of you getting soft tissue fossils. In this case, in the Precambrian, it's the opposite trend. We actually decrease the chances of you getting bird shell type fossils as you increase the amount of birth in your rock. So what, what's going on? Why is there this opposite trend? Um, so let's just think a little bit about how birth forms. So one way that birth forms, as I mentioned earlier, is in early diagenesis from the conversion of kaolinite by dumping in iron two plus. So given that it's a early diagenetic orthogenic mineral, um, if it's got a longer exposure time, it might lead to increased mineral growth. So in this case, lower berthrine and higher illite might suggest that you had limited exposure. How do you get limited exposure? Well, you might have a high burial rate. So potentially what we're seeing here is that in neoprotozoic fossilization, clay mineralogy is not playing the overriding factor in what's being preserved. Instead, it might simply be burial rate. And Tina uh, published a paper last year in geology, which actually looked at this using total organic carbon. And so in these charts here, we've got three different types of preservation. And we've got probability of preservation quality on the left. Blue lines are good preservation, red lines are poor preservation. And what you see is that with lower TOC, you actually get better preservation. And that fits with this idea that burial rate might be one of the big factors on uh, controlling preservation in these settings. So it looks like fossilization of soft-bodied organisms in neoprotozoic mudstones doesn't require Burgess shale type conditions, those precise conditions that were so key for Burgess shell type fossilization. And actually, this is actually probably not all that surprising when you consider the decay resistance of the organisms preserved. So 
if you look at this chart, this famous chart here from Peter Allison from 1988, basically looking at how decay resistant different tissues are. If you compare early animals, which might have, have muscles, to early eukaryotes like green algae, which may have had cellulose cell walls, they have inherently different decay resistance of those biopolymers. So perhaps the organisms preserved in these neoprotozoic deposits didn't need intrinsically, because of how they were composed, such specific conditions to fossilize as early animals. So this begs the question, does, do Burgess shell type conditions exist at all in neoprotozoic rocks? Are neoprotozoic rocks capable of this exceptional style of fossilization that's so key to recording early animal evolutionary early history? So to ask this question, I recently delved a bit deeper into three neoprotozoic deposits with some of the best preserved microfossils to look at whether even in the absence of general sedimentary controls, we might still have similarities based on direct clay fossil associations, which were also important, if you remember, in the Burgess Shale. So I went to these three deposits, uh, the 790 and 800 million year old Svanberg, Philip and Winniak formations from Svalbard and Arctic Canada. Uh, you saw a lot of these fossils last week, uh, two weeks ago in, in Nick's talk, and the one billion year old Lahanda group from Siberia. These have some exquisite fossils, uh, including the first green alga, Protrocladus, um, multicellular things, really beautiful uh, spines on some of these fossils and processes, fantastic preservation. So if anything was going to be Burgess shell type preservation, this might be it. So to probe these direct clay associations, um, we've got to get on a different scale. These, these fossils in the Precambrian are obviously microscopic. So looking at seven by one millimeter areas is not going to work like we did for the Burgess shale. So to get on that scale, we've been employing a new method um, of sample preparation. So we've got these fossils preserved in bedding parallel thin sections. So here's an example of one of these fossils, I think from the Svanberg Phillip formation. And then we go in with a focused ion beam along this pink line here and take out a vertical section showing this second pane, about 30 by 10 by one micron thick. And in this picture here, we've got our fossil is this kind of darker line. And then we've got the surrounding sedimentary matrix. So we've kind of got a cross section through the fossil and its sedimentary matrix. And what we do then is we employ EDS on the SEM to map the elements. So we've done this only for five fossils so far. Um, it's a complex technique, uh, but we hope to expand it to different to, to a number of different assemblages going forward. Uh, and so here are the fossils in uh, thin section. Here are the SEM images. So you can see the, the fossils in, in most of these in dark. And then we'll, I'll plot up the elements next. So here's carbon. So these fossils are, should be carbon, right? That's what they're made of. So you can see there's carbon here highlighting the fossils. With this protocladus sample, there is an enrichment of carbon. It's just very thin. This, this fossil is tens of nanometers thick. It's really exceptional preservation. And then we can plot up aluminium. And aluminium is a constituent of kaolinite. And this is where the data get really interesting because what you can see is there tends to be a halo of aluminium around the fossils. And I've highlighted that on this combined image over here. If we look at that in a bit more detail, this is one of the fossils, a siphonophycus, a filamentous fossil from the Winniat. You've got the fossil here in dark, and then around it, you can see this platy clay. So there's actually physical evidence of the mineral right around the fossil. And that's exactly where these aluminium enrichments are. So it suggests we've got actual kaolinite bonded to the fossil. But aluminium doesn't confirm that we've got kaolinite, right? The aluminium could be in many other minerals, including metamorphic minerals. So how do we know that we've actually got kaolinite here? Well, we can take it to the diamond light source, the UK's national synchrotron facility just south of Oxford. And we can use synchrotron-based infrared spectroscopy, which gives a, a kind of fingerprint of kaolinite based on these OH stretching bands here. Um, and we've got this characteristic signature in each of our samples. Uh, so 
this demonstrates that we've got keonite directly associated with our fossils, just like in the Burgess Shale, which is really exciting. Um, what's interesting is it looks like that keonite is binding to the organic matter indiscriminately across phylogeny. So these fossils we looked at had a range of phylogenetic affinities from cyanobacteria to green algae, and they had different biopolymers. So it looks like this is quite indiscriminate of phylogeny, at least in these preliminary studies. So what have we learned in this second part of the talk about neoproterozoic fossilization and whether we have similar bird shell type conditions? Well, the first thing we've learned is that neoproterozoic eukaryotic fossils are generally not confined to rocks of precise bird shell type clay composition. The actual general sedimentary environs doesn't seem to have that very precise composition that we discovered for the Burgess Shale. However, there are some deposits where we can zoom in and look at direct clay organic relationships, and we do find evidence that there are direct clay organic, kaolinite organic bonds with these fossils, just as in the Burgess Shale. So returning to the main question, how old are animals, and trying to bring these two parts together, um, what have we learned? Can we tie these stories together in a way that gets at this question? So I think, I hope I've shown you three things. One is that these clay minerals, kaolinite and berthrine, are key factors in bird shell type fossilization. Two, most neoprotozoic fossil localities don't share these bird shell type mineralogies or have bird shell type conditions. And this second point is actually really important because it's the first evidence-based explanation for a potential disconnect between the molecular and fossil records for early animals. Most of these deposits where we've got fossils in the Precambrian, in the Proterozoic, don't have the necessary conditions for bird shell type fossilization. It provides that first evidence-based example of how that record may be failing us in some ways. But three, some rare deposits do. Uh, suggesting that the, the conditions do exist, albeit rarely, for the fossilization of neoproterozoic animals. So let's just take a little bit of a deeper dive into the fossils preserved in these rare deposits. Are any of them, do any of them exhibit morphologies that could be argued to be an animal? Well, the answer is no. None of these organisms could be, you know, have been shown to be an animal. And that's the key thing, because what it means is we've got red neoprotozoic deposits with the conditions for bird shell type fossilization, but no animals are preserved. So it should, may suggest that animals really weren't there. And this may provide a useful maximum constraint of 790 million years ago, the youngest age of the deposits I investigated, on to plug into our molecular clocks. It could provide a kind of negative calibration saying that, yeah, at this point, we don't think there were animals based on the fact that we've got deposits that could preserve them, but they're not there. Now, there are likely to be some objections to my logic. Animals were hiding away from the areas of preservation. They weren't in these particular environments. You know, you've only looked at these three deposits. Maybe they're just too rare. Maybe just animals weren't living in those places. Perhaps I haven't considered all taphonomic windows. Animals may be better preserved in cherts, phosphatic settings, or Ediacara-type sandstones. And I think these and others are all valid concerns. But for constraints on a molecular clock, a calibration, all we actually need is a probability. And I think the work I've presented here, this evidence-based work I've presented here, crucially helps refine this probability and will help us better calibrate these trees. So in terms of Darwin's dilemma, I hope I've demonstrated that taphonomic studies have real potential to be deployed to finally provide the satisfactory evidence-based answer that he craved to this issue. And just to finish, I wanna just return to this, you know, my own research and this dual approach. The data I present today have clear direct implications for understanding revolutionary history and the bias of the early fossil record. But they also have another application. They can be plugged in back into work to try, try and find these more successfully. So with this kind of mineralogical search image, we can have a, a more precise and a systematic uh, signature to go look for these fossils. We can systematize our search for the first time rather than a kind of scattergun approach.
that we've taken so far. And working in clay rich settings in Svalbard currently, we're in covering lots of new material, um, which I'm happy to chat about in, in the chat afterwards. And it's not just on the Precambrian Earth that these clay signatures may be useful. Um, thinking about exploration of other planetary services, orbital data and the rovers suggest that the landing site for the current Perseverance rover, but also NASA's Curiosity rover, are in clay rich settings. So this work might be important for finding fossils on other planetary surfaces as well. So with that, I'll say thank you and invite any questions. All right, thanks Ross, that was really great. Um, we, people can get, uh, I'm gonna give people time, uh, but Paul has a couple questions for you already. Um, yeah. and I'm, they're quick, so I'll read them both. Uh, could a similar taphonomic mineralogical approach be used to inform the preservation potential of siliceous sponge spicules? And the second question which was closer to the end of the talk, why were cryogenian or Ediacaran soft-bodied microfossil assemblages in China, like Maui, Lanshian, and Songlu, not considered in this talk? Yeah, that thank should, you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. It should be macrofossil. Sorry. Yeah. Oh. oh, that should be macrofossils. Oh, macrofossil assemblages. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Uh, two great questions. So, um, yeah, we could look at the preservation of spun spic spicules. I think that'd be a, a great question. I, I don't know what the conditions are for the preservation of spun spicules. Presumably, it's got something to do with the stability of silica. So I think it'd be cool to investigate that question. And that's something we should definitely do going forward. Um, in terms of the uh, macrofossil assemblages from Ediacara and Maohi and, and Lantian, there have been some studies recently looking at the mineralogy of those fossils and some arguments that there are clays actually attached to those fossils too. Um, we, I've got some Maohi material right now in the lab and we're looking at that actively. So, you know, the idea is we started at the end member 800 million years ago deposits and, you know, maybe we can move forward through time through the, out the rest of the, throughout the rest of the Ediacaran and look at those, those questions. I think it'd be a great thing to look at. Does that answer your question? Yeah, go for it. I mean, they got beautiful assemblages, so why ignore them? Yeah, no, I agree. Okay, the next question in the, uh, in the chat is from, sorry, Phil, Phil Vixiboss. Um, hi, Ross, great talk. With the survival of kaolinite through prograde metamorphism, how can we be sure that we are not seeing cat catalysis of, say, muscovite retrogression influenced by highly localized geochemical conditions surrounding the carcasses? Yeah, so this is a good question as well. So the, the question basically is, perhaps during that retrograde metamorphism, the carbon that's left in the fossil could actually have an effect on the precipitation of uh, or dissolution precipitation mechanics during that metamorphic episode. What I would say to this is there is vanishingly little carbon left in these fossils, um, very little amounts. And so I think on the entire scheme of things, I don't think it's going to be a huge effect. There's, uh, uh, you know, the, the predominant way that this would happen would be through uh, transformation of elytor. Muscovite and elite muscovite are everywhere. Um, there's also disseminated organic matter in these rocks, not a huge amount either, but there is also disseminated organic matter throughout these rocks. So potentially, you know, that could help uh, catalyze these reactions, but it's not doing so. So that would be my answer to that question. It's a good question though. And I think one thing we, we really need to do is develop our experimental approaches to this kind of work. So going forward, one thing uh, Nick and I, Nick Tosca and I have been talking about is doing a suite of experiments where we can actually try and get to the underpinning mechanics of these clay organic inter in interactions. What is actually facilitating clay precipitation on these carcasses? How does that change with different biopolymer type, different uh, pore waters or seawater chemistry? Um, and I think, the experimental work 
might actually help us in that regard differentiate that hypothesis i think it's unlikely but you know you're right it, it, it is a possibility okay next question on in the chat from mel Grisada. very exciting study and i like your conclusion about the lack of animals at set 790 have you seen the solicified metazoans from 575 ma from norway Margosha, which ones are these you're talking about specifically? Oh, sorry, you're muted. Oh, yeah. Uh, those fossils are from the Digermon Peninsula in northern Norway, and mm -hmm. paper was published one year ago. And yeah. they are silicified, and of course, not everybody accepted it the reviewers were fighting against it but they are solicified and yes yeah, so, yeah, so i think that there's a good question there in about solicified uh biotas right and whether that could be another taphonomic window where you get these organisms we know that uh solicified uh windows um preserve early eukaryotes bangiomorpha is in church for example um and what is the distribution of that through geological time? What's interesting is I think that works quite similar in terms of in terms of the taphonomic bias to the um, shale record. In that, presumably, the things controlling uh, chert precipitation are the enhanced silica, dissolved silica in the Precambrian oceans, which should be there from any time before you get sponges and radiolarians, basically. So. The, the potential may not have changed that much over Precambrian time. So the fact that if you go to somewhere like the hunting formation where Nick has uh, Bangiomorpha and you don't find any animals in that formation, again, could be used as a calibration point on your clocks, a negative calibration. Thank you. No worries. Okay, looks like Nick Butterfield is ready to chat with you. Go ahead. Nick. Yeah. Thanks, Maybe. Ross. That's a lot to think about there. I, mean, I just want to make a, one point about the, the Burgess shale. Is it, it, it's no no questions asked. It has fantastic preservation, but it's a mistake to imagine that everything gets preserved in the Burgess shale. The, the things that you see in the Burgess that are preserved as carbonaceous compressions, all of those things started out with a cuticle, with an extracellular cuticle. What about and, things like nervous tissues, Nick? Did they have a cuticle? Well, they, they, they have something that might might be compared. Okay. Wow. But but there but in, in any event, there, there are a range of beasts that don't have any cuticle at all and, and don't appear um, in the Burgess shale unless you know those you know some of those things are permineralized. And and the one example um, um, is hyolithids. There's lots and lots of articulated hyolithids in the Burgess. Articulated hyolithids that were buried as carcasses. Sometimes they have guts, but certainly all the hard parts are articulated. And and almost never do you see the the, the truly soft parts. I'd argue that's because um, they don't have a cuticle. So, anyways, that you can extend, you can take that back into the Proterozoic and worry worry about. This is one of the things that you. Um, you were aware of and, and, and allowed that we need to think about it. But um, there is a whole, there's a whole range of tissue types and kinds of things that won't preserve even under Burgess shale type conditions. And, and so we need to worry about that absence of evidence data from, from the Proterozoic. Yeah, so I, I agree that you're right that cuticles are overwhelmed, you know, more commonly preserved in these deposits than other types of tissues. If you look at uh, Fareed Saleh's 2020 paper in EPSL, he actually did a survey of tissue compositions. I don't know whether you've seen this paper or not, but he had a survey of tissue compositions in the Burgess, in Changjiang, in uh, Fezawata, and actually showed there were, were a variety of tissues preserved, not in the same abundances for sure, but there were. And I think you know the example of nervous tissues is, is one of those examples where you do have truly soft things preserved. And you know, some people may say they're prioritized, but if you go to Changjiang, they're not, you know, there's examples where they're not prioritized. Yeah. So I think that you do have that capability. And so, and, and, and it comes down to probabilities at the end of the day, right? You know, what we want is a pro to put a probability on this. 
Yep. And I think that if you can refine that probability, you've got to, you know, you can say something. And then I have a, a just a follow up question, if I might. Um, uh, and I, I put up a, an image of it uh, in my presentation, Liz Turner's putative keratosin sponge. Well, that, that, you know, that throws a real spanner into the works um, for, for, on all sorts of fronts. Those kinds of things simply haven't, haven't been recognized um, uh, up until the last couple of years. And then they turned up in, the, in Cambrian stromatolites of all places. Um, but you know, the record of keratosin sponges is vanishingly small wherever you, wherever you look. And you know, hey, presto, here, here's something like a keratosin sponge. If it's not, you know, what is it? Is, is turning up at, um, what is it, um, eight, 890 or something like yeah. that. Um, what's your opinion on Liz's structures? So they do look like the things that have been described as those kind of sponges in younger rocks, right? They have quite similar morphologies. I think that the, the challenge is, right, all you have to go on is morphological data and, with those things. And that's where it gets tricky. You know, whereas with the stuff from mudstones, we can get FTIR data, you can get more dates, more kinds of data that might help us refine the affinity with those things, we really just have morphology. And the morphology is not, you know, it's not the detail you would necessarily like, right? It, it's not perfect. And so that's what I would say is that they may be, but it, it becomes harder to, becomes harder to figure it out when you have less sources of data, less types of data to approach the question with. And, and I'm with you on that. I, 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 I'd, like, I'd love to buy into that. But I, you know, it's it's just you know a single data point that's so separated from from everything else. Nonetheless, it is something that's kicking around out there that we haven't noticed before that doesn't get pre preserved. And buyer beware on this absence yeah. data stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's what I'm saying, right? Is that the you know I think we really getting a handle on this absence is something we really need to do better of, right? We're not very good at getting a handle on absence of data. And it's it's a problem. And I think that if you, you know, what I hope I've shown in this study is that you can do work which actually starts to, starts to constrain that problem. And, you know, it may not be perfect, but you get a probability out of it. And that probability you can use in your micro clock, you can, you know, it, help, it helps us. And it also tells us not only if the record is biased, but how it is, right? To what types of environments potentially, which, which tells us something which is important. I think absence is only useful when you have large numbers. Yep, when you exactly have very right. small numbers of incidents, I don't think absence means much. Exactly right. Yeah, but, you, but if you can put some data on that, Paul, you know, at the moment we, we're flying blind, right? At the moment, it's a scattergun approach. And so if we kind of know where to go look, if we know what rocks are most likely to preserve these things, we, you know, we have a sense of how, how, how big a data set we might be dealing with. Max Lexi has, has a question. Yeah, yeah. Was, go ahead, Max. Hi, Max. Ross, great talk. Uh, good to hear from you. Um, I was really interested in uh, early on in the talk, you were talking about birth urine and uh, mm -hmm. I guess it was also quite interesting to see that, uh, you know, in your, your 2018 paper, you had such a strong correlation with birth urine there. And then, uh, yeah, I guess when you move more into the in-situ work, uh, it moved more towards kaolinite. So I thought that was interesting. But one thing I didn't notice uh, reading your paper, but um, it occurred to me uh, in this talk was um, some of those uh, Burgess shale type deposits um, have really high berthrine contents. I think you, you had it going up to about 30% there. And I was wondering what, um, if you could comment on what those, <laughs> what those rocks actually look like. And, uh, you know, cause they must be really high in iron and whether you're getting um, a really interesting kind of, um, you know, whether that's a lot of orthogenic clay formation or, or an interesting um, diagenetic setting there. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. So the first thing I would say is uh, 
let's I'll start with answer the question by thinking about the difference between the sedimentary matrix and the direct clay associations. You you notice that in the matrix we tend to have berthrine uh, a lot, whereas when we have the direct clay associations, it's kaolinite. And so one thing I think is really interesting is that these bonds between the kaolinite and organic matter actually may be really early, and they may actually stop that kaolinite transforming to the berthrine like it has done in the rest of the rock. Um, so then there becomes a question of, is the berthrine actually really important to the preservation or is it kaolinite in the first place? And it's just a coincidence that we get berthrine transformation. Perhaps the berthrine doesn't matter, right? And that may be the case. Maybe you just need kaolinite there and the berthrine is a bit of a, a red herring in that sense. But then I think you're right that these Cambrian rocks seem to have unusually high amounts of berthrine. Right, so that means that there's got to be some kind of source of iron two there available in multiple settings around the world. Um, and so potentially, as I said in the talk, there could be two ways th that we've thought about that maybe happening. One is that you've got potentially ferruginous, could be telling us about the type of water masses you have in the seawater at that time. So Eric Spillin's iron speciation database, for example, suggests that Cambrian seawater has more ferruginous conditions on average than subsequent um, oceans. But the other possibility is that you've got um, potentially these carbonate cements in these uh, mudstones actually locking in closed system conditions. And Nick is, Nick is shaking his head. Um, but this is one option. Um, so you've got a, you've got a, uh, you could potentially lock, so you could have, you could have local diagenetic conditions, which are created by some kind of global factor, which is affecting uh, where you have these cements or not. And, and Bob Gaines in his, with Shannon Peters in their 2011 paper argued that this could be something to do with increased alkalinity in the oceans associated with the greater unconformity. Um, I, I'm not gonna make a comment on that, whether that's true or not, but you know, these, I think there's an interesting geochemical signal there that you've got from the Cambrian, um, which is, is being borne out um, in the berthrine content. Just uh, yeah, a comment on um, the you know the possibility you raised of uh, ferruginous conditions because yeah. um, I think when you showed those figures from the work that you're doing with Tina, um, it looked to me like the the highest berthrian contents that you had in the near Proterozoic equivalents were only about half as much. I think they're only about fifteen percent. So um, you know that might be interesting to think about. Yeah, in terms of I think I think the other thing you've got the other thing I would I would um, just kind of hedge a bit bets a bit here is that you remember that this data says a little bit biased in the fact that we've gone for fossiliferous deposits only and so it's not necessarily representative of average shales from this mm. interval so that's the other thing that you if you're thinking about global conditions and what's going on um that's something else to consider yeah well that would be really really interesting to look at yeah um well, just one other gonna, yeah yeah one other I was thought say, on that was Sorry, you go. All I was going to say was with Eric Sperling, we're currently talking about maybe doing something with the sedimentary geochemistry paleo environments project to track these mineralogies through from 500 to a billion years ago and actually see if we can get a, a kind of more representative data set for the whole, um, see what the availability of these mineralogies actually are. Cool. That's exciting. Um, just one last um, quick question. Um, in terms of following up on that, so you said that um, potentially the birth urine is just related to, uh, you know, it was all kale and that, and then potentially some of it got converted to birth urine. Um, did you look at when you were looking at these birth urine rich rocks, did you look at whether or not these are actually um, iron two rich birth urines or whether they, they might be um, in some similar kind of, um, you know, 0.7 nanometer phyllosilicates that are more sort of iron three rich because i know that that can be hard to um to pick out so we, sometimes we with xid we didn't look at that question we actually in these studies because of the range of um geological uh subsequent geological histories of these rocks we, you know, a lot of them have experienced very different diagenetic and metamorphic mm -hmm. conditions afterwards we actually tended to clump berthrine with the kind of metamorphic diagenetic product chamosite together mm -hmm. so uh, yeah, I wouldn't think we don't have the level of detail that you would like for that kind of question. We might be able to go yeah. back and look at that in more. It would detail. be tricky to do, but yeah. Yeah. 
Well, thanks so much, Russell and a lot. No worries. Thanks. Okay, next question is from Davis Mejia. I forgot the bacteria you use, the heterotrophic decomposer. Why did you choose that particular bacteria? Are relatives of this bacteria present in the geologic record proximally to the playrich, uh, playrich fossils? Yeah, so the 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 bacteria we used was a thing called Pseudo Ultramonas, which had been used. Um, it was a marine bacterium that we know is involved in the decay of marine animals today. It's uh, oxygenic heterotroph. Um, we used that bacteria because it had been used in decay experiments previously. So Rudy Raff and colleagues had used it in decay experiments previously. However, there are other studies that have worked on sulfate reducers, which show kaolinite at least has a similar decay suppression with sulfate reducers. So different types of metabolism, potentially anoxic decay could be suppressed in this way too. Um, but it would be fun to do more, um, more types of bacterial uh, strains. There's actually quite a lot of kind of alternative medicine literature on uh, clays and decay sup suppression out there. I might stop, okay. should, I, should I stop sharing screen then I can see for it's better? Oh, um, sure, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, often, uh, people use their slides, but it hasn't been happening. Uh, the next question is from Bruno becker Kerber. Hi, Ross. Congratulations on your amazing talk. I have just one question, if I may. How can you be sure that berthering was the precursor for site in your samples? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we, we can't, right? So uh, there are other ways that the, the shamosite could form. I, I think that the majority, this is the main, the major way. So we kind of, we assume that this was the case in these deposits. If you look at uh, kaolinite abundances in these rocks, you tend to have an inverse relationship between kaolinite and the berthrine shamosite. So it would suggest that you do have this kind of formational mechanism from kaolinite to berthrine to shamosite, at least in the Burgess. Um, uh, but given the range of diagenetic conditions and metamorphic conditions we were looking at, we did clump things together. But that allowed us to, to look at a huge data set in, in, in the kind of way that statistically that we needed to, to ask this question. Does that help? Does that answer Bruno's questions satisfactorily? I think. I think he gave, yeah, okay. uh, we'll see if he's here. He, he said yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, I see it. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, one more here from Greg Vitalik. Great talk. Has this kind of work been done with Ediacaran fossils, especially the clay Russian white sea material? So Greg, no, we haven't done it with Ediacaran fossils, especially not with the clay Russian white sea material. I think that would be a fun thing to do. Um, preservation of Ediacaran fossils is also a very interesting question, something that I've not really been involved with, but you know, there are different schools of thought on that. Some people think that uh, pyrotization may be important. Other people think that silica is important. Um, and I think that you can play the same kind of games with opening and closing of those taphonomic windows as, you, as I've put out today for the mudstone. So just as I was talking to Margosha earlier, about the chert record, let's say Ediacaran fossils, silica is really important, which is something that Lydia Tarhan has put out. Presumably, uh, silica cements are controlled by the amount of dissolved silica in the pore waters, which may be related to the amount of dissolved silica in the uh, overlying seawater. And again, you could play this thing where, in general, the Precambrian compared to the Phanerozoic has higher dissolved silica concentration. So maybe you've got the propensity for Ediacaran fossilization throughout the Precambrian. And so the absence of these fossils in rocks older than the Ediacaran may indicate that they really weren't there rather than just not being preserved. So I think you can kind of, you know, depending on how you think these fossils get preserved, you might be able to play the same kinds of games again. Okay. That exhausts all the things that are um, that are typed out or hands that are up. So 
At Looks this like point, we'll just give a bit of an open floor. Sounds good. Uh, so, Ross, uh, just uh, Andre, yeah. I, I presume uh, antibacterial properties of kaolinite and berthorite were well documented. Uh, you mentioned medical literature, but uh, is it something if you would go from tropical setting to uh, intermediate to high latitude, would you see a, a change in preservation, like uh, sort of from my uh, kind of naive view, like if you want to see soft tissues of mammoth, you would go to polo setting rather than a tropical setting. And um, related to this question, maybe you went very fast for me, a difference between preservation of muscle versus cellular material. Uh, can you kind of uh, talk, uh, say something about it a little bit more? Yeah, so I think there might be, um, at least in the mudstones, Andre, a, a paleogeographic bias potentially or a climatic bias. So um, if you take the Cambrian alone, so let's just focus on the Cambrian, um, where you have the soft tissues tends to be those rocks that had kaolinite and berthorine in them. And those rocks tend to be formed, those minerals today tend to be formed in conditions where you have pretty intense weathering, low soil pH, high runoff. Um, and so potentially you could have a bias to those types of environments. And if you, as I said in the talk, if you plot up Burda shell type deposits, basically all of them, um, the Ordovician Fesawata is slightly different, but most of the British shell type deposits uh, plot up in the tropics, tropical paleo latitudes. There may also be a thing going on with the Cambrian where maybe you've got a high CO2 Cambrian anyway. So the Cambrian might've been more likely to have tropical weathering than other environments. So you might, this might be another reason why you might have had more stuff going on in the Cambrian, more preservation going on in the Cambrian than in other time intervals. Um, to your point about tissues i think this gets back to kind of what nick was saying um there are a range of tissues on these organisms um we know they preserve in different ways so if you take my direct clay associations so where we were actually documenting different clay minerals on different parts of the fossil um, if you look at that data what's interesting is you do have variations so that there is more aluminium for example in the guts and potentially, uh, one way you can form kaolinite on the fossils is actually by lowering the pH, because um, that changes the surface charge of the organic matter, and it can also potentially make this bond more likely to happen. So one way you could lower the pH is through uh, initial decay, and some in experiments, both oxic and non-oxic decay, at least initially, can lower the pH. Some of the classic experiments of Derek Briggs at Bristol um, so what's interesting is that potentially the guts is where you had most organic matter or at least the most labile organic matter in the organism. So you could have had more decay happening in those places compared to other bits of the fossil. And if that was the case, you might be able to lower the pH around the guts faster and, and lower than in other areas. And so you might have more kaolinite bonding in those places. But I think I, I'd, so we couldn't assess this statistically because we didn't have enough data. So we got a hint of this, but in the paper, we, we don't really make any big comments about this because the data, we just don't have enough data to look at that question in detail yet. And uh, for difference in preservation for muscles and cells, can you just expand on it? Yeah, I mean, so it's going to be a it's going to be a race between decay and and stabilization of those tissues, right? So each or each tissue is going to have a different biopolymer, a different rate of decay, and so in some cases that might lead to those tissues being lost quicker if they decay fast. But if you decay fast, as I've just suggested with the pH argument, you might actually create the conditions for mineralization, so you might get better preservation of those tissues. So it's it's kind of tricky. Um, and I think doing experiments on specific tissues, looking at clay precipitation is the way to go on this question. Seeing if you can actually get at the underpinning mechanics through a, a series of experiments in different seawater chemistries. You know, we could do something with 
of Cambrian or Precambrian style seawater chemistry um, and seeing what what tissues matter, what minerals matter, what chemistries matter of the pore water for both dissolution of surrounding clay minerals and then reprecipitation or attachment of detrital clay minerals to your organic material. So these are kind of experiments Nick Tosca and I are, are planning to do. And maybe I, if I could just jump in there, I'd, I'd, I'll just point out that for all that spectacular preservation in, in the Burgess, there, isn't, there aren't any mussels preserved in the Burgess Shale. And there's, there's some that are potentially mussels, but by and large, everything is cuticular. It doesn't seem to preserve under those kinds of conditions. Your point about the, the, the nerves are in, is interesting. And there's something about nerves then that is preservable, but fundamentally less so <laughs> muscle. There aren't any planarian worms. There aren't any flat, you know, ap <laughs> uh, apicophron worms, you know, in the fossil record because they don't have a cuticle. Hey, that's by the by. Um, uh, Greg um, mentioned the Ediacaran. The Ediacaran is interesting insofar as it, it doesn't seem to have typical Berger shale type preservation. Um, it captures things by, by other modes. And it, 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 you said you hadn't looked at, looked at any Ediacaran mudstones, but one would be we've interesting. Got Mauhi. We've looked at Mauhi. I, I'm, we're working on that right now with um, Andy Noll. We've, we've got some Mauhi material in the lab. Um, uh, there's been some work on Lantian and Mauhi, actually, by other folks. Shu has done a bit of work on those, looking at clay minerals, and they've documented clays on Mauhi. Um, but they've used EDS. So the question is, are they, what type of clay is it? Is it, was it originally there or is it this kind of metamorphic yeah, association? Um, we, one of the things that's a general trend at any rate, there's always going to be exceptions, but as, as a general tendency, Ediacaran acrotarchs, organic wall microfossils, tend to be relatively poorly preserved. It's sort of a quality and a character of, of a lot of, from of the Protototica, for example. They're there, it's impressive to see them, but they, as a rule, they tend to be really quite corroded, much more poorly expressed than what you get um, yeah. in the so tone Nick, or what you get in the, in the Burgess. Yeah, exactly. So Nick, so one, one thing that we, we're planning, no, I'm planning to do is, so the, the direct clay associations that we've documented with the microfossils using the FIB and the taking it to the synchrotron stuff, it's kind of tricky to do. So we've only done it for five fossils so far, and they're all from those kind of Tony, you no, know, your, your kind of, de your deposits from the Tonian where we do have really, really nice preservation. So one thing we'd like to do is see what is the extent of these clay organic interactions for these microfossils in mudstones throughout the Proterozoic, not just in these places where you get really nice stuff. So for example, in some of the Ediacaran mudstones where we've got these microfossils, uh, potentially in the, you know, with Susanna, we talked about doing the Chuar. Um, so I think that, that, that's definitely the next step and what we've got to do. And you're right, it, you know, we need to, we, we've, maybe we just got lucky this time, right? And we found them on these rocks, but what is the prevalence of this mode of preservation if it's, you know, across different places? I don't know, Margosha might have some views on that as well with the yeah. Ediacaran. What do you make of the phosphatic uh, skeletal occurrences in the uh, Tonian? The scales? Yeah, the scale microfossils, Paul, I mean, it, it's great, right? I mean, they're beautifully preserved. It's a very different style of preservation, right? And you've got a very different taphonomic window there. Um, what so, does it say about nutrients and productivity? And, you know, how can we argue that productivity is low and it's constrained by phosphorus if, if we have this ex extravagant business of, of building houses out of it? So, uh, yeah, so you get... The, the, the one thing I would say to that, Paul, is it gets back to your point about the amount of evidence, right? So how many places have those been documented so far? Perhaps it's a local condition that is allowing that to happen. Well, no, they, it's, the ones associated with the VSMs uh, look like they may be quite abundant. So now we're seeing more of them, right? But they're still yeah, they're also phosphatic. Places. Yeah, there's still only a few places though, right? It's not like you've got every deposit from this interval you go to has these things. But, but more to the point, given the, given the topic today, is 
that you know they've just come out of nowhere. I mean, they, they were utterly unexpected. And what the hell are they doing there? And you know, they are there. There, you know, there is a bunch of stuff going on there that we haven't been seeing. And you know, because because they biomineralize, they've popped into existence there, and and we can record them. And you know, so it's it's really worrisome. We can worry about you know all of those amoebae that don't have tests. Every one of those is paleontologically invisible. So you know, the question is the degree to which early animals are paleontologically invisible insofar as they lacked cuticle perhaps, lack significant movement. I mean, that's the concern. And, and again, I see Liz Turner and say, I wish she would pop up and, and defend those, those sponges, but um, uh, they're, they're fascinating new discoveries. So, thanks Nick. I, I'd be happy to Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Things are pretty terrible here. I've, I've had a horrible year, so I've been keeping lying low. So I'll make that offer and, and uh, I'll do that sometime when, when there's time available in the schedule. Thanks, Liz. What I would say, th thanks, Liz. What I would say to Nick's, your comment is that I think there, there are many things that we could worry about, right? And we should be worried about all these scenarios but if we don't we, we could worry about them all day but if we don't go out and actually find evidence mm -hmm. for what's actually going on how these things are actually preserving we don't really know what we should be worrying about you know so the so my the the point of this work is i i, I not acknowledge that there are um that that, that, that we're not going to capture everything right we're not going to find everything but at least we have some idea of how it's biased and that's really important, right? We know the extent in a sense, or at least we can start to begin to know the extent. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>